everyone, and welcome to the Homeland Security Training Institute podcast. I'm your host, Tom Brady, the Associate Dean for the Public Services Division and the Director of the Homeland Security Training Institute right here at College of DuPage. And as you know, every time we do a show, we talk to experts in different areas of Homeland, homeland Security, and we really do this show to make sure that people out there are aware of what's going on, aware of who's out there protecting them. And this kind of gives you a little bit of a behind the scenes look into that world. And today I have a wonderful guest and it's Detective Mike Drugan. And let me give you a little bit about Mike's background. Detective Mike Drugan has been with the DuPage County Sheriff's Office for 28 years. He has worked in all three bureaus, corrections, administrative, and law enforcement. In 1998, he created the Family Protection Unit specializing in domestic violence. Since then, the unit has evolved into the Special Victims Unit investigating domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, juvenile crime, violent crime, elder abuse, homicide, and others. His background also includes training as a SWAT operator, a hostage negotiator, and crisis intervention officer. He is the commander of the Crisis Negotiations Team. Detective Drugan recognizes the importance of prevention programs and as such has created, and this to me is pretty amazing, over 34 presentations relating to the prevention of teen dating violence, abductions, sexual assaults, and many others. I got to tell you, it's wonderful to have Mike on the show. So welcome, Mike. Good to have you. Thanks, Tal. I appreciate you uh, inviting me here. Well, you know what? I was really excited to have you on the show today. I've read your background. Um, your bio is just really just blew me away. All the things you've done with the DuPage County Sheriff's Office and really, really important things. You know, the, the, the Family Victims Unit, the Domestic Violence Unit, uh, all the things you've been involved in are really, really important. And it, it's it's great to talk to somebody who really was on the, the front end of, of, of actually creating those things. What drove you to really get involved in those areas? I, well, I don't really know, Tom, to be honest. You know, my, my story's not one of growing up in a house that was a, a violent household. Uh, quite often we see kids that experience uh, domestic grow up to uh, – feel that that is a normal way of living and unfortunately, you know, recreate what they what they saw. Mine was the opposite. We grew up uh, in a house that my mom and dad were nuts, even after 56 years, nuts after each other. That's great. Uh, I don't think I ever heard them argue. I know they did because, you know, two Irishmen, are, are gonna, <laughs> they got the Irish hothead temper, but we never heard it. Everything was, uh, it just wasn't around us. And you could tell that, I, I think it was just, I wanted to help people, you know, seeing people live like that. And, you know, most of us go home. At the end of our workday, that's where you want to be is home. You can't wait right. to get home because it's your safe zone. Imagine you're at work and now you're going to go home to a place that's 10 times worse than where you've just spent all day. And I, I feel for people that have to live like that. I want them to know that they don't have to live like that. Right. And I think that, you know, your, your upbringing probably really brought that to perspective more for you because you saw what a good home life was growing up. and. You saw people that were being abused or, or, or whatever the situation was, not having a good home life. And you probably had a lot of empathy for them because you, you, they were missing out on, on, on a good family life. So I'm sure that that had to have a lot of impact on you. Well, absolutely. I, you know, again, I think we all deserve a certain quality of life, you know, and when, when one person decides to force their will on another – that's, you know, like most police officers, right? That's mm -hmm. that's going to bristle us up, and we're going to want to get involved in that. Absolutely. Well, I also want to say that at the start of this is that uh, you've recently retired from the DuPage County Sheriff's yes, Office. So let me congratulate you, Thank you on such a great career. And tell me a little bit about what you're doing now. Well, I was truly blessed. Uh, we have a, a new sheriff came in, uh, Jim Mendrick, and he's got quite a vision. I think, you know, we, we have a great place at the sheriff's office. There's, the men and women really make that that office. And, you know, from all three places, from whether it be corrections, the courthouse, uh, the law enforcement, uh, dispatchers, uh, crime lab, we have a lot of very, very high quality employees. And working there, is, it's a lot of fun. So leaving it wasn't something that I was really looking forward to. You know, my, I believe my shelf life, and if you will, in law enforcement had ended, I was good with that. Uh, but when the opportunity uh, arose to maybe come back and work on some mental health programs uh, and, and really try to take what the sheriff's vision is and, and try to enhance that, well, I couldn't say no to that. that that's a win-win for me. Yeah. And, you know, Sheriff Mendrick, a graduate of the Suburban Law Enforcement Academy Absolutely. here at the College of DuPage. So it, it's great to have him uh, at the helm. Um, 
Mike, I want to ask a little bit about some of the things you did when you were working for the DuPage County Sheriff's Office. And I know that you worked in the domestic violence unit. Um, when you look back over your career, was there a a, ca- a case that was most interesting to you um, that you worked on as an investigator in the domestic violence unit for the DuPage County Sheriff's Office? Oh, there's a lot of them. I mean, you know, I, to be honest with you, I tried to do a really good job of compartmentalizing. Okay. My dad spent some years with uh, CPD when he was younger, and a lot of his friends grew up to be, uh, one of them was the chief of detectives, actually, at a certain point. One of the things he told me when I became a detective was, do not, you know, don't take this job home. Yeah. You will. It's just, it happens, but don't. Do everything you can to keep it at the office. And So I've tried not to think about them, but Things happen. You know, there there were some pretty horrific cases. And to be honest, the ones that a lot of people look right past, the, just your everyday domestic violence is horrible. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and a lot of folks think that there's a, a there's levels. Well, there is, but, you know, it's a living hell no matter what level you're at. Right. So I, I think, to be honest, it's the, I think the accumulative of all of the, we'll call them misdemeanor level domestic batteries and just seeing what those folks are living and going through that – it's just a, it's hard to think people are living like that. Sure, and you always always have to remember there's a there's a victim to all of these things. So Absolutely. Like I like how you articulated that, you know there there's different levels, but it's it's all the same thing. So people are suffering, and and being abused. So I mean I certainly think that that's uh, the work that you did there is 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 tremendous. And very helpful to people. You know the, the things that you did. I mean you were helping people. So you you had to take some reward from the work that you were doing? I mean, did you feel that, like, I mean, it, again, you can't take the job home with you because you see some horrific things, but um, ultimately there had to be some satisfaction for you in helping these people. Well, sure. I mean, every, like everything you learn, it can make you stronger, right? Or you can carry it around and make you weaker. You know, one of the things I do want to mention, uh, if I may, uh, this is all teamwork. You know, what I did was a, a mere, a small cog in what a lot of people were doing. There's a lot of impressive uh uh, domestic violence advocates, family shelter service is one that's out of uh, that that's predominant in our area, mm-hmm. and just does an amazing thing twenty four seven for victims. Um, there are amazing prosecutors out there. There's amazing clinicians that are trying to get people help. You know, so it was a team effort. You know, prosecutors trying to put uh, do their right thing. It it it, it needs everybody. Yeah. Uh, I think what I took away from the job was how to be how to be a better each day, especially as a parent. I have four kids, and I, I found myself uh, being. I, almost a disciplinarian at a certain point, and I realized that take work. What did you see at work today? Come home. What are your kids doing? And then look at the big picture. And, and is what they're doing? Do they need to be, you know, constantly corrected for little minor things, or can you be a better dad? So I tried to take a lot of that stuff and be a better person out of it, and say, okay, what what has life taught me today? You know, my eyes are wide open. So is is my little issue a big deal? And more of the times, it's not. So I think it, it kind of helped me in, in being that learning and evolving as a person that there's so much more going on in the world that, sure. you know, we, we put so much stress on little things that mean absolutely nothing. I absolutely can understand that. So as I was reading through your bio, Mike, one thing that really stood out to me is the, you've developed, you developed what was called the SAVE program. And, you know, now that we work here and we're in higher education, uh, it seemed to me like there would be some type of a connection to this because it was it was based upon education. So say the Save program stands for Sheriff's Alternative to Violence Through Education. So can you tell me more about this program and why you felt it was important to develop it? Sure. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of things in place um, in the county for uh, to try to help folks. So let's say you're convicted of a, a misdemeanor domestic battery here in DuPage. You're going to be sentenced to a 26-week batterers program, not anger management, batterers program, two completely different things. A lot of folks will think, you know, if you're angry uh, and you're you're fighting the difference between a batterer and somebody maybe who has anger management, uh, someone with anger management will lash out at everyone. Domestic batterer will pick their victims, right? Yeah. So what I found was um, obviously we could always do more for victims, but there were programs in place and we were trying to offer programs. Um, the batterers deserve a chance to, you know, upon conviction, they deserve a chance to get better. But what I felt was the children were kind of the underserved population being mm-hmm. we know that 95% of domestic violence is learned at home. So if we know that, well, then why aren't we doing anything to combat, you know, that that negative education? So I thought maybe we could come up with a program to teach kids about safe relationships, which is very difficult. You know, nowadays you bring that up and everybody wants to, to you know, jump on your back and yell it. Uh, and it was never about trying to tell kids how to date. It was trying to, to yeah. walk that fine line of safety for yourself. And what I really wanted kids to do is pick up the warning signs long before 
uh, the domestic violence relationship came to violence. Sure. You know, a lot of this, this starts with small little control innuendos, things like that. And if you're paying attention to those, I think you see them and you realize, okay, this is not healthy. This person pretends that they care for me, but it's not a healthy caring. Uh, and I think just, you know, by, by doing that, we could get these folks out of it. Let's, let's avoid the situation completely. I think education is always a key um, for a lot of these prevention type uh, programs, because if people can learn the signs of what to look for, if there's red flags and you're able to teach people that, you know, it, they're, they're much going to be much better off because they're going to identify that first. And it sounds to me like that was uh, the, the one of the main objectives of this program. Absolutely. It was just to try to provide that uh, that baseline education of, you know, here's your awareness. And if you see these signs as you're growing up, that's, you know, that's a warning sign. Go the other way. Are there any particular signs, Mike, that you can you can let our listeners know in terms of maybe when uh, teens are dating or something like that? Are there any red flags that kind of stand out or things that they should be cognizant of? Sure. I mean, again, you know, not <laughs> I haven't been a teen for a long time. Me neither. Um, you, right? you haven't <laughs> been one. Geez. And now the advent of technology, it's very different. You know, back in our day, it was, uh, you know, you might follow someone to work or you might walk past. If they worked at the mall, you might constantly walk past their little store so you could, you know, keep an eye on them, so to speak. Mm -hmm. If you think back to those days, I can remember a couple um can't remember their names, of course, but relationships where uh, the boy in particular was just infatuated almost to a stalking level, trying to keep his girlfriend safe. And the girl thought it was uh, a positive thing because look how much he cares about me. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want me to get hurt. And it came down to this particular couple situation. If he was working or let's say he couldn't go to a, a party on a Friday night. She could not because that would not be fair to him that she would go alone. And, you know, obviously, hopefully all of us listening to that realize that is not a healthy right. and fair relationship. You should trust the person you're involved with to go and do what they need to do to be have fun and be with their friends. So it's minor things. You know, it's it's a lot of uh, where are you going? Uh, where How late are you at? Who are you with? Um, almost not being appropriate to the level of relationship. Your parents was, should ask those questions. Unfortunately, a lot of them don't, but right. most should. But I think the key is we have to understand that those are we have to teach these kids. That's your boyfriend; they're not your dad or your mom. So there's a level of involvement that they shouldn't have. You know, there's a level of intimacy that they shouldn't try to to uh, usurp and then kind of be in that control factor. Sure. You know, one thing I, I'm thinking about as, as you're talking is with domestic violence, and I'm sure that this is something that you've seen throughout your career. Um, is how, how do you how do we break the chain? I mean, break the chain meaning that there are people who abuse people, but the people that are being abused stay in that relationship. You know, you see this over and over again. From your perspective, I guess the best way I can put it is how do you break that chain? How do you get people out of that situation? What do they have to do? Well, it's a great question. I think um, it's not so much getting them out of it. I think it's more, and I know what you meant by that. It's just, I think it's more of, kind of opening their eyes, educating, explaining that there are options. You have to remember that a domestic violence relationship does not start on the first night. You know, hey, would you like to go out? Uh, yeah, I think I would. Where would you like to go eat? And then there's a physical altercation. A hundred out of hundred, that would be the last time you would see that individual. So what these individuals do, the batterers, is they, they push their authority slowly. They start, like as I mentioned earlier, with the innuendos of, you shouldn't wear that. I don't like the, what what you're wearing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's I don't like you going out there. That's not a good neighborhood. I don't like you being without me. And they they kind of push to see where the boundaries go. And I think what we need to do is, in fact, empower victims. You know, victims are. I've had the majority of victims say what they what it what they want me to do is fix their partner. They love the oh, person. Remember, sure. right? You know, this isn't this isn't like a two hour relationship. This is probably one steeped in some time. They may even have children together, but right. they love the batter. They just don't want the batter to batter anymore. And I think we have to look at that and say, okay, what? How do we do that? We want to right. keep these folks safe, but we want to make them whole again. I think is what we're doing. Sure. So I think part of that is I, I think the batters program that DuPage runs is a great program. It teaches these individuals that they don't have to live that way. And the, the, I don't know the numbers anymore. You know, I haven't been involved intimately with that program in now in a couple of years, but we used to have great numbers of a very low recidivism rate. So I think we need to listen to the victims and I think we need to get them safe. We need to empower them with what we need to, what we can legally. We need to help the abusers too, because if they continue to abuse, what, what are we doing? We're just perpetuating the, the, the cycle of violence. So right. I think we need to be there for them and just, you have to give them time. You have to make sure that the, the victims know that there is help, 
and that we are there to try to help them not come in and control their life. Sure. You know, one of the things I want to also talk about was you, I know you've been involved with the crisis intervention team, a CIT, as it's called. Yes. At the DuPage County Sheriff's Office. So tell me a little bit about how you got involved with that, Mike. Well, that was something that, um, you know, obviously, uh, I believe 1988, if my time is right, Memphis PD kind of started the, the crisis intervention team. That's why I often hear it called the Memphis model. And it's obviously slowly emigrated. I believe 03 is when it, it started coming up in Illinois. And um, it's, it's definitely a program that every agency uh, should see if they don't see the value in it. Um, I think the key to it is it's a communication program. I think that's you know a lot of that's missed out. The key is to to, to educate our officers on uh, mental illness and what it looks like, so the officers can make a better example of what are, what kind of handle, what kind of call are they handling. We know how stressful it is for an officer. You come upon a call, someone's yelling, maybe someone's appearing aggressive. You don't know what you got. Nowadays, officers, the numbers of them getting killed or hurt, you know, in the line of duty are huge. So these poor officers are out there stressed. This, this training is, is meant to, okay, what are they seeing? What are the warning signs? Are they seeing something that looks like mental illness? If so, what other method could we take? Do we need to, do we need to push the issue and maybe push the individual into striking back? Or can we slow it down? Can we change our tone of voice? Can we give them some space? And does that help the problem? And I think that's the key is, again, you know, in communication, it really helps officers to uh, help those folks in crisis to slow that crisis down and get that person to the most rational spot they can be uh, and then try to provide help. So for those of you people out there who aren't aware of crisis intervention team training, so we're not talking about tactical training for police officers. You know, often we often hear of police officers training and they're, they're doing tactical training, you know, uh, firearms or defensive tactics or things like that. But this is different because this is more of a communication, as you said, training. So they're, they're using – they're basically being trained on how to observe people and how to determine if there's something else going on with this person. And that's a pretty big lift to be able to, to train police police officers to do that. How successful has CIT training been? And why is it so important for police officers to get this training? I think the program uh, is, is just tremendously positive on all accounts. As a communications class, what it does is it allows these officers to um, hopefully, our, our intent is to make a, a faster determination on seeing what they have. Um, you know, again, it's a very tough decision. They have sometimes seconds to decide mm-hmm. how to react, and that's even a long time to give them. Sure. Sometimes less than a second. So they have to realize what's going on and, uh, and adjust appropriately. And I think by getting them exposed to that through role play um, with professional actors that we use, it really brings the, the, the level of uh, practice up which we all know under stress, we fall to our highest level of, of training. Sure. And, uh, and and by having that training at a high standard, uh, which we're able to do, the training in Illinois is overseen by the Illinois Law Enforcement Training and Standards Board. Right. And they set a high bar, which is great, because what they do is it allows us to have some of the best trained officers in the state. Yeah. And I think what we see, there's agencies that are sending their whole departments to our training because they see the value in the communication aspect. Obviously, the mental health training is necessary, and these police chiefs know that. Right. But seeing the, um, the the way the officers communicate, the empathy, the level, the change. The uh, I have police chiefs calling up saying, my officers are a different person coming back. Yeah. And that's such a compliment to the program and to all the instructors of what a great job they're doing. Right. And, you know, obviously, it's, uh, you know, we've hosted CIT classes, and I think we'll have a class of maybe 60 officers in, in, in the class but it's just it just doesn't seem to be enough, you know, because every I think every officer I know, at least speaking for Illinois, this is one training that every officer of Illinois is, is, is trying to get. And it, it's just it's just hard because there's so many officers out there um, and just not enough enough training classes. What are your thoughts on offering crisis intervention training while someone's in the academy? Um, I don't know if that's ever even been discussed, but a recruits going through an academy could. Could it be extended for a week and potentially they could be trained in it while they're still recruits? Well, sure. I mean, the potential would be there. Absolutely. You know, I just, my, again, not, not being an expert anywhere near in that field, I don't know if after all of that training, if in adding a week, you know, really would be that much more to them. Yeah. I, I feel the training should be done sooner than later because I think if you don't, you end up developing bad habits. And I would rather officers not you know, develop those. Because right. let's be honest, we look to our mentors on the street. We look to those officers that we think are 
uh, somebody that we look up to. So we kind of emulate them in a way, don't we? And maybe they're not always, you know, the best at things and or they're doing the best they can, but they don't have formal education. in. So I think the sooner the better. I agree. And I think we need to have just a ton more mental health training in general. Um, every year, you know, yeah. and the state's done that. They've mandated programs, yeah. but I think police departments need to do that quarterly. You'll just, and I think the role play, we, we train so much with, with our weapons and our defensive tactics, which is very important, but it's that cerebral thing that officers need done. You know, you, you draw your weapon as we, as officers know, it's not just a matter of drawing your weapon and engaging one individual. You're obviously responsible for your round. You're responsible for the climate. You have to look almost 360 and still be able to focus. I mean, we're asking these people to right, do right. astronomical things. Of course. So I think the more that we train and, and experience these situations, these people in crisis, which, to be honest, you know, as a, a former SWAT guy for a little while, we love to train and do that cool stuff. And it's a very important thing. Yeah. But what's the one thing you do every day as a police officer? You talk to people. Yep. And you talk to people in crisis. Yep. So you need to be sharp as that as on anything else. You know, so I think th- I would agree that maybe moving the training to, you know, after an academy w- would be an awesome idea to uh, to imprint that that basic that we want them to follow. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's all there's all all sorts of different thinking on this issue, you know. And and I just think either way, however it's handled, it's tremendous that police officers are getting this type of training. That mental health awareness training is so critical. And people that are out there who are, have not been in law enforcement, you talk you talk. Mike talked about responsibility of everything that you do. So you're on the job and you're dealing with a stressful situation and you have to make the right decision in split second time. It's really stressful to be able to do that. And I think this training helps people, helps people and allows them to be able to make the right decisions. Sure. The more, you know, it's like anything, the more you're exposed to it, the more you hear it and the more you have a comeback for it. You have a plan. Most of us as officers went to the academy and got, obviously, a long time ago, we got very little, you know, view on (laughs) this. And then we just went with what we could. I mean, gosh forbid you go to your first suicidal uh, call and you're talking to someone who is contemplating taking their life. And you have zero training on talking to them. But yet there you are. It's your responsibility to try and you know, show them that there's a different way. I mean, and that's just, you know, ludicrous. So yeah. I think the more the, the more uh, communicative training we can get with law enforcement, it just creates just a better, you know, we have more in the toolbox. Well, I also want to kind of move to the, the Homeland Security Training Institute is having a crisis intervention team and wellness conference in January. And I know that you are one of the speakers this year. I'm very honored to be a speaker. Well, we're honored to have you because this is the third annual, and it's gotten bigger and bigger every year. And this is the one conference where, you know, we're focused on the wellness of police officers and the mental health training. And I think I think those are the things that, you know, we talk about mental health training, which is critical. But what about police officers' wellness, their own personal wellness. I mean, I think this is so important because we see we see far too many suicides in law enforcement. So I think this is a really good opportunity for people to learn about things that are out there for them. So we, we, we try to do this every year, and, and, we're, and we're thrilled to uh, have you coming on board in terms of um, being able to be a speaker. Um, do you have a topic already that you're going to be speaking about? I do. I'm going to be focusing on correctional officer wellness. Um, as you know, across the board, we all do different jobs, and obviously, there's a unique aspect to each job. And I spent a small portion of my time in corrections, and I can tell you that it's a it's a very different job than people think it is. It's not like what TV will show you. Uh, the job is very, very different, very difficult job. Is 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 training for correctional officers different for say patrol officers? I mean, it depends on what you're talking about. You know, defensive tactics, handcuffing, I think that would be somewhat universal. But I think, yeah, I, I really do think that uh, we – and that's something that hopefully, you know, we, we can address going forward too is uh, I think the correctional officer field is sometimes left behind. People don't focus on that training specifically for our correctional officers. They have a very unique job. Often they're with inmates 12 hours a day. And, you know, and talking about mental health well-being, they have numbers higher than even other officers in uh, suicides and, and uh, post-traumatic stress and things that we're seeing. So I think that we need to affect everybody in law enforcement with this training. I, I believe up Blue Help just said I think we're 200 officers this year have committed suicide, oh. 200 alone this year. 
So that's that's way too high. What's going on? Absolutely. You know, why aren't we looking at this and why aren't we just like pouring everything we can into? And there are a lot of people that are. Don't get me wrong, yeah. but uh, I'm. And, I mean, I I applaud you guys for hosting this wellness. I think in this area, it's extremely important that people are looking out for us, and I think it's great that College of DuPage is. Uh, I know it's a great conference, yeah. and I think I think officers need to be exposed to it. Absolutely. Well, I, we're looking forward to we're looking forward to your participation in it, and I think for first responders, I mean, this is. This type of stuff is really important because you don't think of that type of training or a conference of this nature when you start thinking about, you know, cops and and and, and training for them. But really, to the numbers you talked about with suicide, way, way too high. It, it, that's got to change. Yeah. And we need to be able to be the ones to really tr- kind of draw the line and say, no, there's things out there that you can get help. And maybe they don't know about the help that's out there for them, but that, I think that's what this conference brings to the table. Well, it does, and you have some amazing resources. I, I mean, you guys, I, I wasn't able to go to the first two just because of work scheduling, yeah. but I see the names that you're putting up, like Jessica Crowley alone. I mean, she is she is cutting edge in the field of dealing with law enforcement. She's got some stuff I can't even pronounce that she does, <laughs> and it's really neat because it works. I mean, this stuff is out there. She's a cop yeah. helping other cops, right. and I think those that are at that level – need to get back. It's almost like they should, which God bless us for doing that. But we all need to do that more. I mean, a lot of it is the stigma of mental health. You know, law enforcement isn't uh, opposed to it. They're afraid. I mean, who at their roll call is going to stand up and say, I haven't been feeling well. Uh, I'm kind of worried about my shift. They're worried about losing their job. Right. You know, we need, to, we need to clear those hurdles so that they, like anybody else, can get the help they need. Yeah, we need to get past that for sure. Absolutely. And, it, and it's hard for some people to get past that because, yep. because of the culture, you know, the, the culture of law enforcement. And I, I, I echo what you said about Jessica Crowley. I, I tell Jessica this. I've never seen someone that has the, the passion and the empathy she does for this type of conference. I mean, she's, un, you know this, she's unbelievable. Absolutely. So we're so thrilled that she's, she's, she works with us to put this on because it is a, it is a top notch conference and people get a lot out of it. And that's really what it's all about. And just for people, if they may be listening and be in, if they're interested in this conference, a little bit from information on that, the third annual first responder wellness and crisis intervention conference 2020 is scheduled to take place at the Staff Sergeant Robert Miller Homeland Security Education Center on January 14th and 15th of the new year. To register, go to www.cod.edu backslash HSTI for Homeland Security Training Institute, or you can call 630-942-3723. Mike, I want to thank you so much for being our guest on the HSTI podcast uh, this week, it's really, it's really, really refreshing, and, and it's great to talk to somebody who's been, you know, on lo- on the job for a long time, but has so much passion and empathy. And I can see the compassion that you have um, that you brought to the job. I can just see that in in the time we've been talking together, and that's really impressive. So I want to thank you for being being my guest, and I I look forward to seeing you at the conference in January. Well, again, Tom, I appreciate the kind words. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Um, I'm just glad to be a part of, of what what you guys are doing here. You're doing some important work. And uh, I know that 2020 is going to be a much better year than 19 was because we're all driven to, you know, to make everybody in this area better. DuPage is lucky to have uh, what they have here for law enforcement. Yeah. You know, without COD, you know, we, we'd be focusing on a lot of other things and what the Homeland Center is doing for, for law enforcement and the local training and the fact that you guys have all these other programs going on here. Uh, it's, we're very lucky for law enforcement to be this close. Well, well, well said, and thank you for that. We really do. Are, we're very fortunate here at the College of DuPage to do what we do. So that's what we have for this week. Mike Drugan has been my guest, and it's been great talking to him. And we look forward to more shows coming up. So stay tuned to uh, our our website, which is www.cod.edu backslash HSTI for if you want to listen to any of the past shows that we've done. And we're looking forward to doing more. And we have plans to do more before the end of the year. So, so stay tuned, take care, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>